Dave Messer is going to give us our, bring the message this morning. So Dave, welcome up, and we appreciate your willingness to share with the guys. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Probably uh, 30 years ago, someone who had way too much religion and not nearly enough Jesus asked me what my philosophy of ministry was, to which my response was, I'm here to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So if you're feeling afflicted today, if you're having a tough time, if you're working through a passage in your life that's not the most warm and fuzzy for you, I've got good news for you. You're going to get some comfort today. And if you're one of those that's sitting around today and you think you got it all licked, well, you know, you'll get something today too. How many of you growing up had something on your refrigerator that you brought home from school that had a gold star on a smile or a smiley face on it? Anybody? Oh, come on. Surely. Yeah, we all had that. Had the chart with the chores on it, and if you did the chore, you got the smiley face, and if you didn't, you got the little frowny face. Yeah, we did that. How many of you guys were in Boy Scouts? Raise your hand. Boy Scouts. Yeah. How many of you were high school athletes of some kind? Yeah, lots of athletes. How many of you actually got a letter? How many of you actually got the cheerleader? Okay. Um, How many of you work in a business in which your compensation is in part based on commission? Yeah? How many of you work in a business in which you have performance goals that are set every year and you make more money if you hit certain milestones? Yeah? How many of you own your own business? I got the right crowd then. Okay. Don't raise your hand on these next three questions, okay? How many of you, when faced in a situation with your children, withhold your affirmation or your love for them if they've disappointed you in what what they've done? How many of you use your time or your attention or your affection as a way of controlling what your wife does. See, this is the afflicts, the comfortable part. How many of you attend one thing or C3G or Band of Brothers or a Bible study in your neighborhood or something at your church? How many of you do those things because you're trying to show God that he should love you? We live in a really twisted world. See, Satan doesn't have to come out and jump in our face with something obvious. Oh, that's a sin. I'm not going to do that. Satan's much smarter than that. He uses very subtle tricks. Nothing has changed since the Garden of Eden when he misquoted God. So Satan knows how to get to us, and sometimes we're not smart enough to watch it because we're too concerned about what we're doing. In Romans chapter 12, after Paul's gone through this huge, long theological argument in the first 11 chapters, he says, in verse 2 of chapter 12, he says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'll now give you the David version. Don't be a jello head. Don't be squeezed into this mold, but instead take a scrub brush and some Clorox and scrub your brain. We need to be brainwashed. All of us do. We live in a world that has programmed us throughout our lives to do certain things, and unfortunately, when we come to our relationship with God, we do the exact same thing. So you think about it. Think about all those things we talked about at the beginning. From the time we're this tall, we're told, if you do good things, you get rewarded. If you do bad things, you get punished. Now, cause and effect has a real impact on the way in which we live our lives, the way in which we train our children, the ways in which we interact in a business environment. 
There's nothing wrong with cause and effect unless you mess it up. But most of our lives, we have been taught that love is performance-based. Now, there are two tracks in life, the tangible things and the intangible things. The tangible things, money, shelter, food, clothing, toys, all those sorts of things, things we can get our hands on, those are tangibles. And it is certainly true in most circumstances that if you perform well, you get more stuff. You do a good job, you get the bonus. You do a bad job, you don't get the bonus. You work hard, you train your folks, your business grows. You get fat and sassy and lay it around and the competition comes and cleans your clock. We understand very well that idea of if I work hard, if I do right, I will be rewarded with stuff. We understand that. But where we've really messed it up is somewhere along that line, we start combining the idea of if I'm good, I will be loved. And love is not about being good. If, if love is about being good, you are buying love. And that's not love. And here's where it gets really insidious and really horrible and really nasty and stinky. We go to God like that. And somehow we have twisted Scripture around in our head to the point that we're living lives that are just condemning to us. Jesus said... In John chapter 14, you guys can fill in the blank at the end. If you keep my commandments, I will what? Somebody say love you? That's not what it says. No, it says it's just the opposite. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But we read that and we're so brainwashed with the way the world thinks, we turn it around. And we think that in order to love God, in order for God to love us, we have to do stuff. Folks, there's no grace in that. That's works. That's trying to buy $3 worth of God. I will work hard. I will do Christian stuff. And if I do enough Christian stuff, God will love me more. If I go to Bible study on Friday morning, God will love me more. If I go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night, God will love me more. If I put more money in the offering plate, God will love me more. Here's a news flash for you. There is absolutely nothing that you can do that will make God love you any less than he loves you right now. That is very hard for us to get our hands around. So I'm going to say it again. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that we can do that will make God love us any less than he does right now. But Dave, what you don't know what I've done. I, 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 had, I, had, I had an affair, okay? I was unfaithful to my wife. God doesn't love me. Garbage. He does so. He doesn't love you any less than he loved Billy Graham. He doesn't love you any less than he loves... Pick your pastor's name. The flip side of that's always also true. There's nothing that we can do that's going to make God love us any more than he does right now. All the religious things, all the spiritual things, all the church things, which are good and important things, but just doing them does not make God love us more. But we live in a world that says, if you want more, you have to do more. And insidiously and quietly and sneakily, we start buying the lie that says if we want God to love us, we have to do certain things. And we just walked right out of God's grace and started trying to earn our salvation ourselves. This whole idea of performance-based love, it's, it's so built into our brains and into the way our society functions it has a really bad effect, and the bad effect is this. If we don't do the things that we've decided that we're supposed to do, we become afraid because there's loss. There's potential for loss. 
God might not love me. My relationship might not be the same. Now, now I've disappointed God. Now I've disappointed my family. Now I've disappointed my people at work. I'm now in a cycle in which fear is starting to take hold. But guys, don't feel bad. This isn't new. You want a real brain opener sometime, flip through a concordance and look how many times God told somebody in the Bible not to be afraid. Everybody God ever talks to, he tells them not to be afraid. <laughs> Joshua, commanding general of the Israeli army, taking over for Moses as the leader of the nation. First thing God says to him is, Moses, my servant, is dead. And Joshua's response is, yeah, right, I noticed. Yeah, he went up on the mountain with you and he didn't come back. And God says to Joshua, fear not, be of good courage. And in the first two or three verses there, he says, fear not or be of good courage four or five times. Joshua. And remember, this is the guy that stood there and helped hold Moses' arms up while the sun freaking stood still. <laughs> okay? This is not some neophyte. This is Joshua. And God's telling him, don't be afraid. If you need a whole list, it's a really long one, but here are a few of them. God told Abraham not to be afraid. He told Gideon not to be afraid. He told Joseph and Mary not to be afraid. He told the disciples not to be afraid. Moses, Solomon, Isaac, Elijah, Peter, John, Timothy, he told them all, don't be afraid. So you're in good company. Don't be afraid. And we go, oh, great, okay. I ain't afraid. I got my no fear hat out in the truck. Or if you're from South Georgia, I got my ain't scared hat out in the truck. Remember those? But we don't understand the ways in which fear reaches in and grabs us and paralyzes us. So we're going to talk about that. Again, remember, Romans 12, Messer authorized version, don't be a jello head. Scrub your brain. Take the Word of God and scrub out those bad thought patterns you have and learn how to think differently. The world says you have to be afraid because of all this stuff going around. You want to know what to be afraid of? Just turn the TV on and it will tell you what to be afraid of. And I'm not just talking about CNN, Fox, ABC, CBS. I'm not talking about those guys. I'm talking about the commercials. Did you know that every woman in America is suffering from anxiety and depression. And everybody in this room has erectile dysfunction. <laughs> now let's, let's think as businessmen for a minute, okay? Do you think those people pay hundreds of millions of dollars to put ads on TV if they're not effective? No. You guys buy ad space. You buy ad time. Do you buy ads that don't turn a result for you? No, you don't. So Viagra, Cialis, why do those guys sell so much of that product? Because guys are afraid. Guys are afraid that if they can't perform sexually like they could when they are 18, that their wife is not going to love them anymore. They're afraid. Now, if your doctor has prescribed a medication for you and it happens to be Viagra or Cialis because of a physiological issue that you have, that's okay. But if you ran down to the store and ordered some from some Canadian pharmacy because you're afraid, that's a different issue. But our society tells us the things that we have to have a fear of losing. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your sexual ability. Maybe it's your money. Maybe it's your social status. Maybe it's your power. We have all of those things by which we value ourselves, and fear says you might lose them. So what do we do when we get afraid? What do we do? What's our response? And our response is, well, I've got to take care of this fear. I can't handle this. I'm, I don't like this feeling. Anybody here like feeling afraid? Now, I know there are a few wackos out there that like 
to like jump off of cliffs with a parachute and you know drive cars 280 miles an hour because they need the adrenaline rush, okay? I mean, some adrenaline junkies are just nuts. But one of the reasons they do it is they need that adrenaline push. That's the only way they feel human. But most people aren't, aren't wired like that. So when we get afraid, we do things to replace the fear. C.S. Lewis was talking about this very issue, and he says, it's perfectly natural to have fear and to be uncomfortable about life's circumstance. And we all wish we reached a place at which we did not have fear. But until we reach that place, we're in real trouble if we try to find substitutes to clean it up. You're afraid. How many guys do you know? Think about the guys that you know that were on top of their game. They were in their prime of their life. Everything was going well for them. And nobody knew it, but they were really afraid because it started when they got home. They stopped on the way home and had a, a scotch before they got to the house. And then when they got home, they had a couple more with dinner. And then because they were so keyed up, they couldn't relax, and so they had a couple more after that. And three or four years later, they were out of the business. They'd lost everything they had, and they were a raging alcoholic. Listen, folks, guys don't become alcoholics because they go wake up one day and go, hey, let's go drink a fifth of vodka this morning. People turn to drugs and alcohol because they're trying to mask their pain and their fear. And don't be fooled. Christian men are no different. Everything that an unchristian person can do, we can do. And we can justify it just as easily. <coughs> Men get older. Their wives get older. I don't know if you've noticed, but when you look in the mirror, you don't look like you did when you were 19. Okay? Some of us delude ourselves <laughs> into thinking we still look like we did when we were 19 or we even look better than we did when we were 19. But your wife doesn't look like she does when you got married. Your romantic relationship is probably not what it was like when you first got married. And too many men turn to pornography because they're trying to deal with the fear that they're getting older and they're losing their sex appeal. Many times that then acts itself out in, a, in an illicit relationship at work or with someone they picked up on the bar or someone they met on the Internet. And people you thought had the most solid marriage in the world, you wake up one day and you find out they're divorced because the husband had an affair with a 20-year-old. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, hey, I think I'll go wreck my marriage today. Nobody does that. But because of the fear of loss, we make stupid decisions because we can't accept the fact that we're afraid. It happens at work. How many folks have you known that, oh, it's only 100 bucks out of petty cash. Nobody's going to miss it. It's no big deal. And three years later, they've embezzled $280,000 and they're going to federal prison. I've got a personal friend of mine that happened to. And when I asked him about it, I said, what were you thinking? He said, I wasn't. I said, no, seriously, what were you thinking? And he said, I didn't have enough money to sort support my wife in the way that she would sort of expected. And when I hit a little rough spot, I decided to use the company's money to cover the gap. And it was just too easy. Because he was afraid. He ended up doing 22 months in a federal prison for wire fraud because he was afraid. I don't know about you guys, but I look in my heart. <laughs> Ooh, I know what's in there. It's a scary, scary place. Here's one that I don't like. I've been preaching to you so far, so now I'll preach at me. I will take a show of hands. Here we go. Hi, I'm David, and I'm a procrastinator. <clears throat> Guys, you know why we procrastinate? And I'm telling this is a struggle for me. Here's why we procrastinate. One of two reasons. We're either scared to death that we can't do whatever it is that we have to do. That's part of it. 
and we can't face the possibility of we might fail because we're, come on, we're the, we're the top 1%. We're not used to failure. So if there's a task out there that's a little intimidating to us, we just keep pushing that one off. Here's the other downside of being when that top 1% stuff. We've always been successful. We've always been able to, through sheer work or mental horsepower or just getting in there and digging at it, we've always been able to get the job done. And we know that we can get the job done. And there's no satisfaction in doing that mundane task that we have to do. So what do we do? We do absolutely nothing until there's a deadline sitting on our face so horrible that it turns the adrenaline on and we knock the task out. And the problem is when we do that, we're not facing the issue that is this. We're coming full circle now. We're back to performance-based love. We're back to finding our acceptance and our affirmation through the things that we do instead of who we are. So we're going to break, and we're going to go to the tables. And you got some pretty tough questions to deal with, and we'll deal with them. Here's the good news. So far, it's been, okay, let's admit it. This is not warm and fuzzy, right? Anybody feeling warm and fuzzy? I didn't think so, okay? When we come back from the tables... We're going to look at the cure. And the cure for fear is so simple and so elegant, it is going to blow your mind. We all come in here and we're all wearing our mask. I'm wearing mine. You don't know what's going on in my head, and I'm not going to tell you. Why? Because that's how we are. We're guys. We're tough. We're strong. Every one of you in this room, including myself, has fears. We have issues that we deal with. My wife and I have been married over 30 years. We don't have any kids. Who's going to take care of us when we're old? I don't want to die alone. I was talking to someone the other day. Well, it was Ron, actually. I had lunch with Ron the other day, and he's talking about some guys that he knows. These are the guys that are going to carry his coffin. I don't even know anybody that would carry my urn. Those are issues that I deal with. We all have those issues if we're really honest about it. When you wake up in the middle of the night and you're staring at the ceiling, there's stuff that we deal with. When we come back from the, from the break, when we get finished working at the table, we're going to talk about the cure for fear. And guys, I'm telling you, if we get our hands around this, it will revolutionize your life. It will revolutionize your business your marriage, your relationship with your kids, and most of all, it will revolutionize your relationship with God. So go to the tables, do the work. We'll be back in about 20 minutes. Okay, guys, let's let's bring it back in. I heard a heard a number of good conversations going on, so let's bring it back in and see if we can bring this crazy thing in for a landing. Hang on, guys. Here we go. Yeah, let when you guys that can whistle whistle. Okay, I heard a number of conversations at some of the tables, and they were pretty interesting. Um, Let's try to land this airplane, so get the seat backs up and, you know, tray tables up and all that stuff, and, and let's see if we can land this thing safely and come to a place of peace because this has been a little heavy, been a little tough. It's getting ready to get a whole lot better. From listening to the conversations at the table, everybody's dealing with the same stuff. Your stuff might be a different color or a different flavor, but it's just as real to you as it is to anybody else. 
and it's just as paralyzing, and it's just as much a secret that you can't tell anybody else because then they're going to think you're weak, and we can't be weak. Too many people depend on us. We can't be weak. One of the tough things about being a partner in a law firm is the associates come to me and say, David, I need help with this. What, what should I do in this situation? And what I want to say is, I don't know. <laughs> but I can't because they think I know the answers. So I can't be weak in front of them. So you do the old, well, you know, if I told you, you really wouldn't learn anything from it, so you should go research this for yourself and come back to me. That way I'll know what the answer is too. Guys, on the back of your paper, there are three blanks. If you, if you grab these three blanks, what we're going to talk about here, if you grab these and you make them a part of your life, I am promising you it will change the way your life works from here on out. It's not going to be an instantaneous overnight change that just fixes everything and it's flowers and unicorns, but it's the sort of thing that you can hold on to. It's an anchor that you can drive into the ground, and when the wind blows and the storm comes, it's an anchor you can hold on to. Here we go. How do we break this cycle of fear? How do we become what Scripture calls Steve Shelby, you mighty man of valor? Wouldn't that be cool? You're... Your body's laying there in the coffin and people come up and all they can say is, mighty man of valor. That's all they can say. When I met John, I was going to a funeral in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We were on an airplane. He was going for business. I was going for a funeral. The guy that I was going for the funeral, for his burial, was an Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal survivor. Not many of those boys left. I got there. The Marine Corps Honor Guard was there sitting outside of their vehicle. They had already put the flag on the coffin, and they're just standing back waiting on their turn. And I walked by, and they, hello, sir, how are you? And I said, I'm not a sir. I work for a living. And they all got a kick out of that because they were all NCOs. And one of them said, how well do you know the person who's being buried? I said, I know him very well. I said, do you guys know that he's an Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal survivor? And the look on their faces, they were like, wow. They were so honored to be burying a fellow member of the Corps that had been at both of those battles. They were stunned. They had never buried anyone from either of those battles. Incredible honor to be burying Mr. Sears. You want to be a mighty man of valor? Let's do it. Blank number one. Recognize that fear is not from God. Number one, recognize that fear is not from God. I think the, the verse is on your card. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind or self-discipline. <coughs> when you're afraid, that ain't God. Period. End of discussion. When you're facing a fear... That is not something that God sent to you for your strength and encouragement. That's just a lie. God has given you, he has given me a life, his life, that is three things. It's not fear, but instead it's power, dunamis, dynamite, Power to get the job done. God has given that to us. Love. We're not reacting out of fear. We're doing things because of the love of God. And thirdly, self-discipline or a sound mind. You are not losing your mind. The mind of Christ is not confused. And God has given us a sound mind He's given us a spirit of power and of love. Number two, recognize that sin, excuse me, recognize that fear comes from sin. 
Now, David, you know that 1 John 1.8 says that if we say we don't have sin, we're a liar and the truth of God is not in us. Okay, I'm not talking about sinless perfectionism. I'm not talking about complete sanctification this side of the grave. But fear comes as a result of sin. What's the first thing that Adam ever said that's recorded in the Bible? You know what it is? Adam, where are you? Um, I'm over here in the bushes, and um, I'm naked, and I was afraid. You know how stupid that is? How long had Adam been naked? His whole life. He didn't know anything else. What a miserable, pitiful man of an excuse. That's the kind of excuses we make. Instead of owning up to it, he's hiding in the bushes. And he makes up an excuse and says, well, I was naked. That's why I'm, why I'm hiding. No, the truth of the matter is, Adam, you're afraid because you sinned and you know it. Sin leads to fear. There are two things in the New Testament that make my life very, very difficult. One of the verses says, whatever you do, whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. I don't like that verse because that means when I sit down to write a brief this afternoon, I have to write that brief to the glory of God. When I'm in court and I'm presenting an argument to the judge, I have to present that argument for God's glory, not for mine. But I like my glory. I like people to tell me how smart I am and what a brilliant orator I am and what a fantastic trial lawyer I am. I like people to tell me that because it makes me feel warm and fuzzy. But every day I have to put me on the back burner and say, God, whatever I do today, I will do it to your glory. The second one is even worse. The second one says that if we do something without faith, it's what? It's a sin. But God, I know how to do this. I don't need your help in doing this. Okay, I just said I can do it in my own power and not in God's power. You know what that makes that action? No matter how sweet it is and how cool it is, it's a sin. I don't like those two verses. They are very painful for me because they require me to get off the throne and let God be on the throne. And that's hard. That's not something that you do once. That's something that... Maybe you can do it once in the morning and get away with it. I got to do it all day long. And when I forget, I'm in trouble. Here's the third one. And this is the part that is really so, so cool. The cure for fear. Here it is. Ready for it? This will change your life. The cure for fear is knowing who your daddy is. The cure for fear is to know who your daddy is. And not just know that God is your father, but know what God is. What is his character like? We started off talking about not being a jello brain and about scrubbing our brain with the word of God. Here's, here's your Brillo pad. Here it is. You ready for this? It's in 1 John chapter 4. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. You need to read that about a thousand times today. If you need to get it down to five words because that's all the time you got, perfect love cast out fear. You can do push-ups to it. Perfect love cast out fear. You can run to it. 
perfect love cast out fear. You can take half a second in the middle of your day, perfect love cast out fear. Because when we understand that God loves us, we don't have to worry about rejection. We don't have to worry about dying alone. You know why? Because if I die alone, God's there with me. I don't have to worry about my business failing. You know why? Because if my business fails, God is with me. I don't have to worry about getting cancer because if I ever do, God is with me. I don't have to worry about being 90 years old and sitting around drooling on myself and crapping in my pants. You know why? Because if that happens to me, God is still with me. Perfect love casts out fear. And if you're dealing with fear, if you're dealing with anxiety, if you're dealing with a storm in your life right now, get a hold of the perfect love of God. It is not based on what you do, whether that's for good or bad. It is not based on your performance. It's not based on how good you behave. It is based purely on God's choice that he decided to love you. He looked down through the aeons of time and decided, you know what? I'm going to love Ron. He decided that for everybody, but he did decide that specifically for you. And guys, when we get hold of that and we really understand the love of God, it will revolutionize the way we think. We're going to wrap it up with this. This is Paul's prayer for his Ephesian friends in Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And listen to this, guys, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, will be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. There are two things in there that are quite remarkable. Remember, Paul is no slouch when it comes to legal argument, and he is no slouch when it comes to writing. And he says first that you, he prays that you will be able to comprehend, you will be able to understand with your brain the incredible scope of God's love. And then he takes it a step further. And he says, not only will you mentally know it, to be able to comprehend it, he says that you will know, and that word is an experiential knowledge, that you will experience the love of God that surpasses what you can know. Not just what we can figure out from the Bible, but what through the Holy Spirit we can experience that far surpasses what we can know with our head. The word surpasses is hyperbolo. It literally means to throw over your head. The experiencing of the love of God is so far beyond what we can mentally understand. And Paul prays that we would know the love of God. Fellas, my prayer for you this week is exactly what Paul's is. That as we walk through our life dealing with all the circumstances that we come upon, dealing with all the struggles we have, dealing with all the victories we have, that we would know the love of God because perfect love casts out every fear. Take that home with you guys. Perfect love casts out fear every fear. You're going to run into somebody today that needs to hear that. And I pray that God gives you the courage to learn it and to live it and to share it. Thanks so much for your attention and for letting me share with you this morning. God bless you all. Have a fantastic week. Ron?
One Thing's for Men meets at Cabernet Steakhouse in Alfreda, Georgia on Friday mornings from 7 to 8 a.m. If you live in the Atlanta area or visit the area on Friday, we would love to have you join us in person. And if you have been blessed by this message, please consider supporting One Thing for Men online.